Hi, hi. Hi, Barbies. <laughs> hi, Kens. <laughs> and Alan's. And the Allens. And the Allens, exactly. And the weird Barbies. Any weird Barbies in here? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for joining us. Oh, we're sorry, Marco can't be here, as you know, but we're delighted to have you both here today. Thank you. Um, we're gonna that, that disappointment you feel that Barbie's not here, that's Ken's life every day. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So we've got some clips to show today and we're going to talk about both your characters. Um, but I also wanted to kind of start off talking about the genesis of the project and, you know, Margot and Greta, because obviously Margot produced this. She took it to Greta. I mean, what a team, those two. I mean, everyone here has obviously seen Barbie and knows what they achieved with all of you. Um, America, do you want to start and say how you feel about that collaboration between those two wonderful women? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that for me, certainly, you know, that that was the reason to engage, right? I, and I never imagined being a part of a Barbie movie. I didn't have any desire to be a part of a Barbie movie. I was not particularly a Barbie girl growing up. But knowing that, you know, knowing that Margot, who is so deeply talented and easy to watch on screen and warm and intelligent, was going to be Barbie, I mean, immediately took that to a new depth. And then knowing that Greta was behind the writing. And yeah. so I was just so excited to see what they had in store. And by the time I was done with the script, I, I was just, I felt like I had been on some kind of a, of a, of an assisted trip of, a, of some sort. Um, it was, it was just so bonkers and weird yeah. and, and unexpected and, you know, laughing and crying and not sure what I felt, but I was in by the end. Yeah. Right. Do you want to speak to that a bit? I felt like, <clears throat> you know, I would have done anything to work with, with them, and uh, but I didn't realize that I would do anything, <laughs> <laughs> including shave my legs and get a spray tan and bleach my hair and uh, yeah, just can as hard as I could. Well, you did it very well. <laughs> Congratulations. Tried. Um, and I want to talk about the craftspeople as well, because, I mean, it looks incredible. I mean, the production design, the set design. I mean, what was it like being on the set of Barbie Land itself? It was so moving. I mean, as you say, the, the craftspeople were all just the best that there is, from the Sarah Greenwood and Rod Rodrigo Prieto, who was shooting it. I mean, it was just, like, top-notch everywhere you looked, you know, the best that you could get. and and they were using all this incredible art in service of what is essentially child's play. And it meant that like for me walking on the set, I, I got nostalgic um, for just for like child's play, yeah, you know? Yeah. And like I said, not necessarily for Barbie cause that wasn't really my memory, but, um, but it, it made me emotional almost right. to see such high art used in the service of something so joyful. Well, we're going to have a look at a clip in a minute which shows off that production design and also shows off some great chemistry between you and Margot. Um, so let's have a look at the clip of the journey to the real world. I laugh every time oh. I watch that. And I love that you're word perfect singing along there as well to the song. <laughs> Um, Ryan, let's talk about Ken, um, Ken and Barbie, as we see them there early on, um, slightly unequal relationship. Um, and the, com the chemistry between you, Margot, is terrific. Can you talk a bit about getting that balance between the comedy and the real sincerity? Because there's so much earnestness, I feel, in both your performances there. Mm. I say it's funny watching that part because uh, that boat scene where we're on the boat was the first thing I shot with Margot oh, yeah. as Ken. And I had brought that um, seagull puppet with me, and I would ask somebody to puppet it so we could kind of be a. Uh, I could Just be like I, from home. I I, I talk. <laughs> I talk to the, yeah. You know, I always I always come with As a you do. with a. But I um, and then Margot. This is what this is, speaks to to what it was like to work with Margot because mm. she was like you brought a seagull puppet, amazing. Whereas I can tell you, ninety percent of the actors I've ever worked with would be like you brought a seagull puppet, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so she was so, you know, it just, I'm, I was always trying to impress her and uh, my, uh, because, a, you know, Ava, Ava Mendez uh, um, said to me, you know, look, you have to uh, just, 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 just try and get Barbie to notice you. That's your job. You know? <laughs> so it's sort of method acting in a way. Very. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
you know, they do go on quite a journey through the film, as we know. And um, I think there's a really interesting clip that we can have next, which is about an honest exchange about their relationship later in the film. Let's have a look at the next clip. Like so many scenes in the film that combines comedy with some serious drama and also some really serious points. And I think that's probably one of the reasons Barbie's been so successful that, you know, it's quite groundbreaking, right? We're, we may be used to seeing those kind of scenes in the gender reverse. And um, it touches on a lot of things I think men and women have related to. Could you talk a bit about the reactions you've had to those kind of moments, Ryan? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's been, it sort of was like a slow reveal. Uh, shooting it was interesting because we were able to see the crew's reaction to those scenes. Mm. And, uh, you know, Mar Margot had a pink day on set where you had to wear pink or you would be fined. <laughs> How much? I, I forget what the fine was. Do you remember? It went to, it went to charity. Okay. Um, <laughs> But you know, she didn't. No one ever had to pay it because, it, the, like, especially the men on the crew were so excited to wear pink and, and not just to wear it because they didn't feel like they had permission in their lives to wear it, but also because uh, they just were in such awe as we all were of what Margot and Greta were creating, and it became this sort of like, you know, at the end of Dead Poet Society where they stand on their desks and they're <laughs> yeah. like, "Oh, Captain, my Captain," yeah. it was like that. It was just a way for everyone to show how you know, just how much we admired what they were doing. And and then it just never ended. It was sort of started there. And then um, the Fast and the Furious was shooting across the on the other stage. Yeah. And they were all in these black <laughs> fatigues, like SWAT gear. And they were watching <laughs> us walk by in tiny shorts and minks. And <laughs> they'd slowly find their way onto the Barbie set. Like, oh, am I not on the wrong set? And uh, it just kind of was infectious. And then I think by the time we were uh, promoting the film, we went to Mexico City and there was 20,000 people in a mall oh wearing pink, dancing, not seeing the film, just wanting to be close to the film. It really was, you know, because the, the way that it was created was during lockdown, during the pandemic, um, Greta and Noah just sort of, you know, were, were movies and social events were sort of hanging in the balance. They were sort of writing this this thing that in in the hopes that if, if if we could ever get back on set and start making movies and going to theaters they could write this sort of uh you know this almost like a global theme party where everybody was invited and uh it was working and it was working way more than we ever even thought it would yeah Mark, could you, we're going to get onto your character in a minute but i wanted to ask you as well about you know that sort of groundbreaking as aspect in the script and this is doing something very radical in a mainstream movie and also i feel it's quite strong in terms of representation did you want to speak to that a little <clears throat> yeah absolutely i mean i yeah you know i think greta and margot knew that they were going to take the approach of making barbie land include so many different kinds of Barbies. And Mattel and the Barbie brand actually did this sort of what Greta calls the singularity, where like all Barbie, Barbie was all the Barbies and all the Barbies were Barbie. And, and, and they created all these different size and shapes and colors. And so there's that incredible representation that we see in Barbie land, which I think is essential for, for as many people who have related to the film to get to find a way in, you know? And for me, the added incredibly unexpected moment was that Greta had written the role of Gloria on the page as a Latina for no other reason than that's how she saw her. But this was not a character that like, needed to speak Spanish, she wasn't undocumented, you know, she wasn't, there were right. none of these stereotypes of like why people write a character Latina on the page. And, and that was so moving to me, I thought. And I remember asking Greta, like, why, if it didn't factor into the story in this way, why did you think of Gloria as Latina? And she just said, that's just what she always was to me. And, and you know, I've worked in this industry for over two decades and, and it's, I, I don't even need one hand to count the amount of times that, you know, being Latina and the stereotypes of being Latina weren't somehow baked into a role that was written for a Latina. So that was huge for me as an actor. And I think really huge as an audience to get to see yourselves reflected, but not in the, you know, not because being Latina was the character's reason for being. She represented 
all humans. She represented moms. She represented this very internal journey of, of re-enchanting her own life. And so it was, it felt like as an actor, a gift of being freed from so many of those stereotypes and very powerful for me. And I think powerful for audiences as well. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, Ryan, with Ken, I think a lot of people relate to Ken, you know, um, for lots of different reasons. Um, but there is another clip that we do want to show. Um, and can we have the next Ken clip, please? <laughs> Plenty of time, so let's get stuck into that scene, actually, because I think people here would like to know how that was to film that. Just for if you ever see this movie again, try to just watch Kingsley right. in the back of that scene okay. and just enjoy. I was wondering what you were watching. He was getting ready for Bob, uh, Bob Marley while he was shooting this, right. so he would be in between takes working on Bob Marley, learning the songs, transcribing everything, and but also in tiny shorts and headbands. <laughs> uh, um, so where do we begin? <laughs> the Ken sequence. What would you like to know? Um, what was the shooting like? How long did it right. take? Um, you know, choreography. For that whole sequence? Let's do it. Okay. Sequence. <laughs> um, I don't know. We did that in a day. Yeah. Um, we was, because it was sort of like not in, initially in the script and it sort of evolved as we were working and um, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I feel like almost like Greta and I might have had the same relationship that Gloria and Barbie had where like sort of you know, Barbie's having these ideas of irrepressible thoughts of death and stuff, but because you're having them. But there were moments where I would like text Greta and I'd be like, Ken must dance his feelings. <laughs> <laughs> and she would be like on it, you know, talking to the choreographer and, and uh, this sort of whole, you know, dance sequence evolved. And I think because it sort of felt like once you started applying the rules of the world, it was like the, the Kens would only really know what they learned from play scenarios that they'd been right. involved in, which are not very many. And the one thing that they were involved in was those was they would dance with the Barbies. So it felt like the only way they could express themselves was probably through dance. Like they'd want to fight, but they wouldn't know how. So it would have to turn into to a dance sequence. And um, yeah, so then Mark started working on the song and it just uh, evolved from there and it, uh, you know, it, it, uh, I have to credit my kids too so much because they were, they were like the source of my Kennergy and that they came to set that day and yeah. they were, um, it's the only day they've actually been to set, but, uh, the, on a film I've done, but they knew all the words and all the lyrics and they were behind the camera, just kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> what did doing. they, what did they say? What did they think about seeing you do that? I think it was a little strange. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, this is what you do. <laughs> Yep. Do they like the movie? They haven't seen they it. Too, yeah. I, I don't yeah. think you should see your father, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the appropriate age is. <laughs> Here's a question for both of you. I mean, and it's an obvious one, but when you know you read the script, and, but did you imagine it was going to have the impact? Like we're talking about that it's worked its way into a lot of people's everyday lives, obviously catchphrases, but obviously very meaningful to a lot of people as well. Did you, did you have a sense of that when you started out on it? Did you? It, um, well, I, I think th those experiences, like I'm just Dave, were sort of like, oh, okay, this is, <laughs> I could feel it was a lot of the, the men on the crew were sort of, you know, I'd be doing a scene and they'd be like, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> God, you know, and I was like, okay, this is, nice. this is landing with them. So it, I felt like it might, yeah. But what did you feel? I, yeah, I felt. I did. I feel like when I read the script, I thought, wow, yeah. this is so unexpected. And, and and so unexpected to enter a Barbie story in a Barbie world and come out the other end feeling like seen as a human. Yeah. And, that, you know, that that it's a movie about a doll, but really it's a movie about what it means to be human and what it means to be alive. And what an incredible delight and surprise to get that in something that you never that most of us don't expect to feel so moved by. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's um, come to Gloria because, I mean, what a character, and I think someone that a lot of people can relate to as well, obviously. I mean, I grew up playing with a Barbie and um, 
but a lot of Gloria's comments and quotes feel very rooted in the real world, um, yeah. which is explored beautifully. Um, shall we have a look at the monologue clip and then we can, we sure. can talk? Yeah. All right, let's look at the monologue. <laughs> I just want to say that no one should have to watch themselves on a big screen this close up. <laughs> oh I can see your pain and thank you for suffering that. But honestly, I mean, that was a treat for us to watch that again yeah. because it really is an extraordinary scene, beautifully written and amazingly performed. Um, what did you, what resonated with you about that writing? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. As I was listening, yeah. I was remembering a conversation. It was actually the first conversation that Greta Margot and I all had together. And we were, we were talking about Barbie and Gloria's relationship and, and what it was ultimately about and 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 what they do for each other. And, um, you know, we talked about Gloria being um, a, a person who needed to re-enchant her life, you know, give, give some meaning and purpose and inspiration back to herself. And, and it was through this thing that she was connected to as a child that she that she could find that re-enchantment. And, and yet what it leads her to is this kind of very hard truth, but the thing that probably led to her disenchantment, right? right. The, the impossible assignment. And we talked about that, about how, how that, was, that was the meeting point of Barbie and Gloria's experiences as women in the real world and in not the real world, that the assignments were impossible that what we expect Barbie to be to us is all things, and she can't be, right? Yeah. That how we feel about this doll says more about ourselves than it says about her. And that really Gloria came to Barbie to free her of her assignment, to say to her, it is impossible to be the thing that you're being asked to be. And that she can say that for Barbie and that she can say that for herself and kind of free them both and free us all from, from that, mission that we think we're on which is to be perfect and 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 in be and in trying to be that lose um the joy of life right yeah. um so we we had so many conversations about it um gloria uh, uh because and i've said this many times now but like one of the things i really had to get into was like okay this is a grown woman and i don't want her to be um, thought of as a child because she loves a childish thing. I want her to be thought of as a grown woman who's a mother and a wife and a professional and, and, and all of the things a woman is. And what unlocked it for me is there's this documentary called Tiny Shoulders. Has anybody seen it here? No? Oh my gosh. Well, if you like this movie, go watch Tiny I've Shoulders. Heard it's fantastic. I seen it's it about, it's about the Barbie brand and it's about there's this one woman um, who is the lead designer and she's so passionate about Barbie and she's also so passionate about evolving Barbie into the 21st century and she's really responsible for the singularity of Barbie the opening up of Barbie and she got so much um, she got so much pushback from every direction. Everyone at the company was like, Barbie is a legacy. You don't mess with Barbie. Barbie means too much to people to try to make it all these things. And then on the other side, everyone was like, you're progressive, you're cool, you're a feminist, you're a lesbian. Like, why do you care about Barbie? And for her, she had this child picture of her and her mother playing with Barbies. Um, on her desk and it was this childhood connection and this real life complicated woman who knew that this thing she loved was imperfect but it was still valuable to her and like that totally unlocked Gloria for me and made me feel like like we can be imperfect and still be valuable to one another you know and um I don't know, I answered a lot of your questions, I'm sorry. Questions you didn't even ask, but that's-, um, that's I keep going, yeah, I can just no, listen to no, you talk about that all day. You yeah. know, that, so that's like a lot of, some, some, of, the, some of the things we, we talked about in terms of Gloria's journey. And that speech resonates with so many people. Yeah. And how was it to perform? It felt amazing. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, I started out doing theater as, as a young kid and getting to, um, it felt like doing theater, you know, each monologue is so long, it's like four and a half minutes or something like that, five minutes. Um, 
And each take, I did it beginning to end, probably like 30 or 50 times. And, um, and we tried it every which way. I mean, really, it was, we did it a million different ways. And, and as an actor, it just, it was incredible to get to just play and sort of let the words kind of take me wherever that take was going. And um, kind of similar to Dave, um, I'm just Dave. <laughs> We had like a lot of the crew guys like tearing up and crying and like, and and it was something we were experiencing collectively. Like, um, and I felt people's energy. I felt people responding to the words and 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 Greta, Greta and I said so little to each other in the in the filming of the scene. She would kind of come over to me and like just put her hand on me and be like, "You want to go again?" And I was like okay, yeah, let's go again. And we would just see where the next thing took us. So I don't know, as a, as a actor, it felt like, like it felt kind of like just swimming and, 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 and having a lot of freedom to just um, live inside of, of the words that she so beautifully wrote. And how hands-on is Greta in terms of giving you direction and sort of vocal emphasis and that sort of thing? You know, it, it it was so much more, I don't know what your experience with her was, like particularly with words, but Greta is, you know, she she's a master of language and 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 she hears it the way, you know, she wrote it the way she hears it, and she hears it a certain way in her head. And and up until this scene, she would have us run lines and she would sort of like close her eyes and just like listen to hear if it was right. And when you'd get it, she'd be like, that, that's the one. You know, she didn't have to look at you. She just had to hear the cadence. And so there, up until that point, there had been real um, boundaries around it and targets. And, and that felt really good because I wanted to give Greta what she heard. And then in this scene in particular, she was like, I don't know. Let's just see. And, and that was kind of that was kind of scary at first. Um, but then it just kind of became fun. And I, of course, it was exhausting and cathartic and all the things. But um, but it was mostly fun, which seems weird because it doesn't seem like a fun monologue. Mm -hmm. But um, but I enjoyed doing it. Yeah. How did you find Greta in terms of that, you know, back and forth about the dialogue and such? Well, we both have little kids, and so we just were, that was the touchstone. And, and obviously, we, we were both little kids. So, you know, that was, it, it made it, you know, very easy because, or such a great shorthand, you could get to the point because it just felt like they were, they were constantly, I mean, so much of what I, I was doing was just, I just got from my kids, and, you know, they're just the funny, I mean, my, my actually, my oldest, who's nine, she was like, I told her I had to come and do this. And she was like, you should tell them a joke. And, and I was like, okay. I was, she was like, yeah, I, I made one up. Do you want one? And I said, yeah. And she said, she said, well, it's Christmas. So like, what if you say, um, what do you call someone who's afraid of Santa Claus? You know, Santa claustrophobic. That's pretty good. That's good. <laughs> so they're they're funny yeah. and uh you know and obviously Greta's kids are too and so we we just were we would just talk about our kids a lot and working with Margot as an actor but also as producer um America how is that when you're in a scene with her does she kind of switch into producer mode at any point or is it just how does that work yeah I'm are we sure that Margot's a person she might be <laughs> she's like a robot or a side she's the next generation of human for cyborg. If you're ever like on a plane that's crashing, you want Margot on that plane. Yeah, because she could. Okay. She could. You'll you'll live if Margot's on that plane. Okay. She'll she'll find a way to survive. This is a true story. We were flying to Mexico City for press, and I was sitting across from Margot, and she was typing on her laptop because she's never not doing something. And I was like, I don't know, scrolling on Instagram, being super productive, <laughs> and my coffee. The plane like moves, and my coffee goes towards her and her computer and I'm like <gasps> and I'm panicking and she goes like this <laughs> <laughs> and goes back to her thing and I was like did that was that real like I don't yes. I don't think she's real all of that to say like she is unbelievable mm -hmm. like her ability to she's the hardest working person I've ever worked with 
She's insanely good and talented at everything she does. Let me talk briefly about some of the other, you know, heads of department and the craft, because we talked about Amazing. production design, but costumes alone in this, I mean, wow, how many costume changes, but all serve the plot and the story and the character so brilliantly. Mm -hmm. Then if you'd like to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, working with Jacqueline was just, I, I so, she's, she's just so, um, you know, just free creatively. I mean, and again, like what a tall order. And everybody had a different outfit for every moment. And, you know, and in a way, a lot of what, I mean, certainly with, with the Kens, all, all we have is our clothes. That's it. Not, <laughs> we have the clothes on our back. We don't have yeah. jobs, cars, <laughs> houses, personalities. We yeah. have nothing. Uh, so the clothes meant everything. And if you're trying to get Barbie to notice you, you know, it really means a lot. So she she sort of, she worked so closely with me and was really helping me to sort of, and also to kind of, because we had to create outfits that Ken never had. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of it came from just like things that I, you know, like I loved Stallone when I was a kid and then I found out he had like a, a mink company for a while, so. <laughs> Hence the mink, and then also loved Karate Kid, so then headbands. Oh. It, it was, it became like, you know the Coco Chanel rule, like, before you leave the house, take one thing off? Yeah. My, oh, my Ken rule was like, before you leave the trailer, like, put four things on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is such a treat to hear. I could listen to Greta talk all day about the craftsmanship of this. Everything from, like, the pinks that were banned from Barbie Land and why, and the pinks that were allowed in Barbie Land, and even the light, the whites in Barbie Land were pink. They were, like, the lightest pink. Peak. Wow. Um, the set, all of the props and major set pieces were reduced by 23% so that the people would look bigger than the than the cars and that made them look more doll-like. You know, the 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 backdrops were hand painted, the mountains, the sunsets, they were hand painted. And that um tr those transportation scenes that we watched to the real world and then back to Barbie Land. Those were like life-size dioramas, you know, that you yeah. made at school. And and what we saw when we were sitting on those rockets or ships or boats was like crew people puppeteering butterflies and like turning the dolphins and the 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 craftsmanship of it. And then the the thought and the cinematic decisions and references behind basically every single thing you see on screen is is all. Greta and, and these incredible uh, heads of departments that she brought to the table, but it really is um, uh, something else to hear her talk about how she came to basically what is water in Barbie land? You know, that that was a conversation. What does fire do in Barbie land? You know, it and and how that, you know, each thing was motivated emotionally and, and story wise, truly beautiful. And it set the bar for performances, I think, as well, because if they were going to put that level of detail into, yeah. you know, every, every little detail, it sort of felt like, well, that's that's the bar that we're we're reaching for. And it doesn't as an audience member, it's a film that you really benefit from multiple viewings. I mean, I've yeah. seen it three times. Anyone seen it like 10 times or loads? Yeah, we've got some hands there. Yeah, there's quite a few repeat viewings. And you do get more out of it each time, don't you? And I feel like as we were laughing there again, you know, there's so yeah. much detail. Um, is there anything we haven't touched on before we turn to the audience that you'd like to talk about in terms of I just like the music is mm. so phenomenal and like a whole other layer of mm. it and like hearing Mark Ronson talk about it. Mm. Um, there was a um, I was watching um, some clip that Greta had done and well Mark was talking about how that Billie Eilish song the what was I made for song how how Greta didn't want it to the I didn't want the first time you heard that song to be in the moment where where Barbie was choosing to be human. And so if you go back and watch it again, what you'll notice is that the melody is introduced super early on in the story. And it's in these moments where Barbie feels a little bit closer to human that this melody is almost like compelling her towards becoming a human so that when you're in that moment, your subconscious is actually very familiar with that melody yes, and, yeah. and just like layers and layers of, of every part of the craft. It, I think it, it does warrant many, many yeah. viewings. Yeah, and Mark Ronson is, um, I, I, this may or may not be true, but I, th I think what, the way I experienced it was he was just gonna write the dance song. Yeah, two songs, I think, you're, Ken. Well, but, but that wasn't even there first. Oh. It was like, I think it was just 
he was going to write this dance song. Party song. And then suddenly it was like, okay, he was going to write the Ken song. And then he was just kind of, then he was just going to, then he just ended up scoring the whole film. And it's, you know, he's, by the way, he's like one of the original Kens. He's, <laughs> he's been Kenning for Barbie for, since before there was a term for Kennergy. You know, he's just uh, really just understood this he understood this movie on such a deep, in such a deep way. It was beautiful to watch his connection with, with Greta. And Noah Baumbach, I presume, did you have conversations with him about, you know, Ken, because as a co-writer? Well, he was actually editing White Noise at the time. Mm -hmm, so yeah. he, every once in a while, would get a note yeah. via, like, satellite, basically, from, <laughs> from him, because he would be at home uh, editing his film, but he also had a feed of the oh, monitor. Wow. So he and Greta were conferring. And, Quite contrast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's no, um, like, research material you can <laughs> find. There's no doc on what it might be like to be a 70-year-old doll that nobody cares about. <laughs> there's, uh, there's no documentaries. There's no books. There's, there's no one you can shadow. Um, but, you know, I think what, uh, what really... Um, what I love, and I've heard um, America say this, and I, I, I'm always tr trying to re-quote America, but <laughs> she was saying that, you know, this, the film, um, it sort of helps you, and it, it kind of encourages you to sort of be kinder to your younger self, or I think something in that way, you know? And I think that, uh, you know, I used to be like a, when I was eight, I was a wedding singer, and uh, I would sing like, during the garter ceremony for some reason um, to the bride. Uh, and uh, I would sing like, when a man loves a woman. Oh my God, too weird. <laughs> Which led to, uh, you know, doing the same thing at malls and then uh, to the, when it was led to the Mickey Mouse Club. And, and at a certain point I thought I had like retired my hammer pants and I could like move on from that. And I was very quick to sort of distance myself from that and start a new career as, as, as an actor. And, um, but I realized when this, when I was kind of trying to find how to do this, I thought the, the, what I really have to do is I have to go back and like pull that kid out of retirement <laughs> and ask him for his help and just give him one last dance. You know? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I, that was, you know, f finding it really was through sort of like kind of going back and sort of, you know, collaborating with, with that little dude who had worked so hard to get me where I am. Mm -hmm. you, you want to start? I mean, <clears throat> one of the first things Greta... <laughs> In one of our first conversations, she said to me, like, we were talking about the monologue, and she goes, well, what would you say? Like, why don't you just write down what you would say and send that to me? Mm. And it's like, I've never had a director say, like, I did all this work, and I wrote this script, and I wrote this beautiful thing that I like so much, but why don't you, actor, who's done no writing, <laughs> you know, please tell me what you, and she meant it. And, and like, that collaboration, that generosity, that... She's she's the smartest person on the set, but she's also the most open and collaborative and she's having more fun than anybody on the set. Like mm -hmm. she is just loves making movies so much that it's infectious. It's like that Ken moment where the stars come out and yeah. they're like, ah, that's what it feels like on set. Yeah. Well, just in fairness. America has a TED talk that she did write. That's brilliant that you should watch if you haven't seen it. And, uh, Thank you. But, um, yeah, you know, Gre I, Greta, it's so hard to, it's like, it's like trying to describe like pointillism, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, it's a picture, but you kind of, it's like the millions of dots that make up the picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so many facets to her personality. There's so many facets to her. You can't help, but just sort of, you know, be enamored. And I think like, that that's that's sort of like this the real thing that's going on with this movie is that we people love the film but they really love Greta yeah 
And uh, it's a, it's kind of like what it's like to hang out with her. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, when she was making the film, just in every way, it felt sort of different and like the right way to do it. She, um, on most films, there's like Video Village and it's very official and it's like the, you know, the like the pilot's chair or something. And meanwhile, Greta's like sitting on the floor with an iPad. <laughs> watching it kind of almost like 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 a kid like a you know like I mean and maybe this I have only made this film with her but maybe like you would play with Barbies like sitting on the floor playing with it playing with it and it, it felt like play she also knows exactly how she wants it it's like um she can be very precise if she if she needs to but then at the same time constantly giving space for everyone um I'm trying to think of other examples. Oh, dan we would dance every day or there would be like, cause yeah. we had dancers on set. She'd just kind of make everyone get up and stretch and dance. Really, and, like uh, everyone, cast and crew. crew and yeah. the, yeah. Every, yes. Yeah. I mean, they, the crew guys again acted like, ugh. And then they were just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. You, there's video of Rodrigo, our DP, like dancing in the middle of the circle yes. of Barbies. It's pretty brilliant. That does sound rather special and quite different from other films from what I can gather. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs>it's so funny you say that because <laughs> I, I remember when the first picture of Ken came out and then um, actually my buddy Mark who's here my costumer has sent this thing to me someone was like oh no is this our does this have to be our new personality <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think you're right it is a good it's almost like a um, like Neapolitan ice cream <laughs> <laughs> we got all three flavors now Well, I wouldn't want to Ken-splain. <laughs> to anyone how they should feel about the film, I think it's, uh, you know, it'll resonate with who it resonates with in the time, like any film, that when you're ready to see it or, or not. I think it's, uh, it's clear how I feel about it. I, I um, you know, I really, I, I think it's really special and, and, and beautiful. And I know that there's, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, um, it resonated with a lot of men, but it, it, it won't with, with everyone, you know. But it's, I think more than anything, what I think was so beautiful, like brilliant about the way that Greta constructed it is that it's just supposed to be fun. Yeah. And like, or like a party. And like a party, you can dance or you can kind of hide away in a corner and have some kind of in-depth conversation. You know, there's, there's many different ways to experience this film, which is... There's so many layers to it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to say that someone should experience just just one of them. You know. But it's clear that a lot of people were surprised by how much they loved this film when they went to see it. And I think it's resonated with a lot of people here. As you can see, we've got mm -hmm. a real mix of people here. Great. And it has been like a party speaking to both of you two. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.